In recent decades, consumption of ultra-processed food has climbed worldwide, coinciding with increasing rates of obesity, diabetes, and other diet-related conditions. In response, policymakers have begun to take steps to try to limit the harms associated with these products. I'm Stephen Morris, the Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Darius Mozafarian, Director of the Food is Medicine Institute at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University, and a professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Mozafarian has written a perspective article about policy approaches to address increased consumption of ultra-processed food. Dr. Mozafarian, what types of foods does the term ultra-processed generally encompass? This is a classification system that comes from a categorization called the NOVA system. And NOVA is just the Portuguese word for new, a new system that was created by researchers in Brazil who wanted to move beyond nutrients. Their hypothesis was that processing itself, independent of sugar or salt or fat or vitamins, something about processing itself was causing health harms and had health implications. And so this NOVA classification system includes several categories of processing with the highest category being ultra processed foods. And this actually is the majority of foods in the American food supply, about 60 to 70% of calories are now ultra processed foods. And how has consumption of ultra processed food changed in the United States over the past few decades? How did we get to that number? Well, we only can go back about 20 years with very reliable national data on consumption using national surveys. And certainly consumption has risen over those 20 years. It's harder to be very explicit and quantitative going back further, but just looking at the types of foods that are available and looking in other nations where there is data going back, these types of foods have dramatically increased. It's important to understand how ultra-processed foods came about. And this was done not initially as a nefarious way to make people sick, but compared to the 1930s, food has dramatically changed in this country and in the world due to a few major trends. The first was really focusing on getting vitamins into food and fortification. That's one form of processing. The second was really shifting to very inexpensive crops like wheat, corn, and rice to make sure we had enough calories to feed the world. That happened with something called the Green Revolution in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And then the third major wave that led to ultra-processed foods was a combination of two things. One, a focus on low-fat foods. In the 1980s, we wanted to make low-fat foods, and that meant if you're going to be taking fat out of yogurt and muffins and milk and breads and other foods, we needed to add emulsifiers, sweeteners, flavorings, colorants to try to mask that fat reduction. But then on top of that, many of the major food manufacturers were purchased by the tobacco giants R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris. And when Philip Morris and R.J. Reynolds bought the food companies, they didn't just say, okay, you guys keep doing your business as you always have. They said, look, we know how to sell tobacco. We know how to make tobacco addictive. We know how to trigger the brain. We know how to do really aggressive marketing, brand loyalty, market to kids. And so they started thinking about food the same way they thought about tobacco. How can we actually alter the compounds in the food? And they did studies looking at brain MRIs and looking at the brain's reward centers and cravings and marketing studies of brand loyalty. And so that led to really kind of the chemical explosion of putting things in foods to try to activate the brain and trigger cravings. So those trends focus on vitamins, a focus on calories, a focus on lowering fat, and then this negative focus on making food more addictive kind of started to create these foods that didn't have really anything that you would have in a home kitchen in them anymore. They had molecularly disassembled food particles from starch and sugar and fat combined with sweeteners, flavorings, colorants, emulsifiers, thickeners, preservatives, partially hydrogenated oils, fractionated oils, intracertified oils, hydrolyzed proteins. And so that is really the definition of ultra processed foods. And this growth, it's really things that are not in a home kitchen. And for a consumer, that can be identified by, again, looking, for example, at the ingredients list, which we can talk about. But clearly, we've dramatically changed our food from, let's say, even 30 or 40 years ago, but certainly compared to 50 years ago, where now ultra-processed foods are the dominant choice that people have when they go to a supermarket. So before we get to the ingredients list, what's known about the health effects of ultra-processed food? What's all this doing? We have to, I think, more clearly define the ultra-processed foods, as I said. So it's really processing methods, additives, chemicals in foods that would not be normally found in a home kitchen. And so 
some chemical emulsifier, some artificial or low calorie sweetener, molecular decomposition of the food and repackaging it and extruding it through a hot gun like is done with some cereals or puppy snacks or savory snacks, things like that. The, the kinds of foods that really don't look like what you would again buy and put together as natural ingredients in your home. We know as a class that these foods are linked to poor health. There have been now over 80 studies from around the world, long-term observational studies, showing that people who have more calories from ultra-processed foods versus less have higher risk of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular risk factors, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, even potentially outcomes like poor mental health, mood disorders, inflammatory bowel diseases, and even all-cause mortality. Now, those are all observational studies which have their own limitations, but there have been two very well-done short-term randomized trials, one in the United States, one in Japan, that show if you have a diet that's ultra-processed versus a diet that's minimally processed, even accounting for nutrients like fat and sugar and salt and fiber, if you have diets that are ultra-processed versus minimally processed, people unconsciously eat many more calories on an ultra-processed food diet, up to three or four or 500 more calories per day, and they gain weight without even thinking about it or noticing. And in contrast, when people eat minimally processed foods, they eat less without even thinking about it and lose weight without even thinking about it. So if you put together all those observational studies plus those trials, it's very clear that on average, ultra-processed foods are causing health harms. The trillion dollar question, or maybe the $10 trillion question, is which specific characteristics of ultra-processed foods are causing these harms? Is it every possible defining factor, or is it just a handful of key defining factors? Because then we could know to avoid those foods and we could fix those processing methods. And then secondly, very closely related to that, are all classes of ultra-processed foods the same? Is an ultra-processed cereal have the same health effects as an ultra-processed yogurt, an ultra-processed bread, an ultra-processed soda, or are they different? And we're starting to get to some of the answers to those really important questions. And then getting back to the ingredients lists, if a consumer is trying to identify these foods, what additives on the lists are indicative of a foods being ultra-processed? This is a Almost impossible task for the average consumer, unfortunately, right now, because if you just look on the ingredients list and use kind of the grandmother rule of, let's say, is this an ingredient that I recognize that my grandmother would have used in cooking and I don't recognize the word, that could help get you there. But for example, many fortified vitamins have names that are difficult to recognize for people like riboflavin or some other vitamins and, and adding vitamins doesn't make a food ultra processed. And other more natural ingredients could also have unusual names. And then some additives that could be harmful might be hidden behind more natural sounding names. And a great example of that is processed meats that in the United States are allowed to put uncured or made with no added nitrites, but are actually made with fermented celery juice or beet juice, which are loaded with nitrites. And so they have tons of nitrates. And I would consider that an ultra processed food. And so it's actually very hard for the consumer. And so this is one of the challenges. I think big picture, a consumer can step back and look at a cereal that has unnatural colors and unnatural flavors and all kinds of unnatural, not common sugars or snacks or sodas and say, those are ultra processed. And then, of course, go to the fruit and vegetable section of the store or get pick up poultry or eggs and milk and know that that's not ultra processed. So big picture, I think consumer can tell, but we're in a tough, tough spot. And so this is where labeling policy really matters. I think we need to start to help consumers with dietary guidelines, with potentially labeling, with other ways to really help identify ultra-processed foods. So in terms of health effects, are there differences between different categories of ultra-processed food? This is an active area of research, but so far the evidence suggests that not all ultra-processed food categories have the same harms. And so the types of ultra-processed foods that are particularly linked to adverse health outcomes include sugar sweetened beverages and beverages with artificial sweeteners, processed meats, ready to heat and ready to eat meals, savory snacks, candy, those ultra-processed foods are particularly linked to harm. A lot of other ultra-processed food categories are more heterogeneous. It probably depends. For example, cereals, if you have an ultra-processed cereal that's very high in whole grain and some other beneficial compounds, it's probably not bad for you and could even be good for you compared to an ultra-processed cereal that's all sugar and starch. And then interestingly, some categories like ultra-processed yogurt and ultra-processed whole grains, despite their ultra-processing, are still linked to health benefits. 
suggesting that the positive attributes of those foods, the yogurt or the whole grains, are still outweighing the negative aspects of some of the processing. And then what are the mechanisms that underlie these effects? This is an area of active research. Clearly, there are negative effects of starch and sugar and salt, sort of the three S's, starch, sugar, and salt, and ultra-processed foods. But as I've mentioned, even independent of nutrients, there are harms of ultra-processed foods. So beyond the starch, sugar, and salt, I think one of the really important negative features of ultra-processed foods is their loss of natural intact food structure. When you don't have the natural food structure, when foods have been molecularly disassembled, you get rapid digestion in the gut, which lets nutrients like glucose and other nutrients flood the bloodstream and causes all kinds of negative counter-regulatory responses. But you also, in addition to flooding the bloodstream with excess nutrients, you actually starve the large gut microbiome because without natural intact food structure, not enough nutrition gets to the gut microbiome. And so you have this double hit of too much nutrients to the body and not enough nutrients to the gut microbiome. A third feature of ultra-processed foods that is causing harm is what they've lost. They've lost fiber, polyphenols, vitamins, minerals, other bioactives because of the processing. A fourth harm is the additives. We're still learning about this, but more and more evidence suggests harms of specific sweeteners, colorants, flavorings, emulsifiers, and preservatives. And then lastly, there are toxins and contaminants in ultra-processed foods that aren't in minimally processed foods. Toxins from the industrial production like furans or heterocyclic amines or acrylamide, and then packaging contaminants from the plastics like phthalates or bisphenols or microplastics. And so all of those features, I think, together are causing harm. It makes it hard to define one feature, but it also is very concerning that so many different aspects of these foods could impact human health. And as you say in your article, policymakers have begun to respond to increasing public concern about these ultra-processed foods. So what policy actions have been taken at either the state or the federal level? So there's many, many things that are happening, and it's greatly accelerated in the last couple of years as we've really started to understand the impact of these ultra-processed foods on our health, particularly the obesity epidemic, although they have many other health effects. And there's things going on at the state level, at the federal level, and also international. And so the types of policies that have really been happening around ultra-processed foods are across seven categories. One is taxation. So sugar-sweetened beverages and candy are two obvious ultra-processed foods generally, although you could have a totally natural sugar-sweetened beverage or totally natural candy, but that's pretty unusual. Most of them have a lot of additives and artificial compounds in them. And so multiple U.S. localities, cities, counties, and more than 50 nations around the world have taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages. 19 states now have taxes on candy. There's taxes on junk food in Hungary and Mexico, for example. So taxes is one way to deal with ultra-processed foods. In California, for example, there's an executive order from the governor to deal with ultra-processed foods. And I think taxes on some of these items might be one of the recommended policies. A second policy domain is labeling. As I mentioned, most consumers have a lot of trouble identifying these foods. And so There are labeling initiatives going on. In Mexico and Argentina, for example, there are black box warning labels on the front of the package for artificial sweeteners, which would define an ultra-processed foods. The United States does not have that, and I think that would be very helpful if we had an ultra-processed food front of pack mandatory label, and the FDA does have the authority to do that. School meals is also something where there's a lot of action in the United States. New York City, for example, a few years ago, created new school meal standards, eliminating partially hydrogenated oils and processed meats. And there's a Texas bill and other bills in many states around the country just introduced in the last year to ban ultra-processed foods in school meals. And so that's, I think, going to happen. We're going to have some states that are banning ultra-processed foods in school meals. There's also interest in eliminating ultra-processed foods from federal food programs, from federal nutrition programs like SNAP, or the program that used to be known as food stamps. Three or four states already have approved demonstration waivers to test removing sugar-sweetened beverages, drinks with artificial sweeteners, or candy from SNAP benefits. The USDA has approved those, and there's at least another 10 states that are actively considering this. So so how can they start to get rid of some of these categories of ultra-processed foods from federal food programs? Another very important element of this could be what governments buy or what companies buy. Companies, the government, buy a lot of food for their cafeterias, military buys food, this large area of sort of procurement. And right now, there's no really active plans for this, but this 
could really change incentives for food manufacturers if governments, large companies said, you know, we're no longer going to purchase ultra processed foods for our cafeterias, for our vending machines, for our, our other food service. And then the last two areas of policy, which are under active consideration, are really more kind of direct regulation. One is how do we actually regulate these additives and eliminate these additives from the food supply? The United States has a very different regulatory framework than Europe or Canada or England or Australia or New Zealand or other similar countries, where we basically, in the United States, we let food companies put whatever they want in food as long as they themselves denote it to be safe and have done their own studies and not even publicly notified the FDA. We kind of let the wolves guard the hen house. There is movement to change that. And the Secretary of Health and Human Services has directed FDA to try to close this loophole. And while we're waiting for federal action, many, many states have laws banning specific additives that define ultra processed foods from foods. And so California has led the way. They have seven different dyes and compounds banned. But there's now 20 states around the country that have bills that have passed or are actively being considered. And so I think with all the states taking action, the federal government's going to take action. We're going to have a very different regulatory framework in just a few years around these additives and food. And then the last domain is around marketing. It's very hard to restrict all marketing of ultra processed foods in the United States because of the First Amendment, the right to free speech for companies. But there is very good evidence that young children, children less than let's say age eight, can't really differentiate advertising and marketing from regular programming. And so for them, marketing is actually deceptive. And so the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, could ban ultra-processed food marketing to young children. And other countries have done that. And so Mexico, Argentina, some other countries have banned ultra-processed food marketing to children. So those are all really active things going on. And I think the average researcher, clinician, patient, member of the public has probably heard of these things and knows about these problems, but the pace of policy and the potential for policy to really take on ultra-processed foods is pretty remarkable. Thank you, Dr. Mozaparian.